Hi, today we're going to do rum, part two, the distillation. Last week in part one, I covered the history and the recipe and some of the techniques that are used to produce a molasses-based liquid, whether you want to call it a wort or a beer or a wash, that is fermented to produce the precursor that generates rum. So if you like what we're doing in part two, you'll want to go back to the first video and see how we got to where we are today. Some caveats, safety. We're going to be dealing with thousands of watts and very hot liquids, some of which are flammable and some of which are toxic. So if you're uncomfortable with the principles or the chemistry or the techniques, take these videos as sort of a good starting point. Find somebody locally that can help shepherd you through this with some hands-on experience because safety is important. The second issue is regulations. In almost all the world, distillation per se, the process of separating chemicals in a solution using heat and differential vapor pressures, is not regulated. But there are certain parts of the world where even ownership of a simple flask is restricted. Now today I'm not going to get into the principles behind those politics. That's for a different day and a different channel. Coming soon, so stay tuned. Nevertheless, the distillation of one particular molecule, ethanol, ethyl alcohol, is highly restricted. The reason for that is two parts. One is taxes. There's a lot of money associated with the taxing of spirits. Back in the late 18th century, it was the tax on whiskey that the U.S. government used in order to finance the large debt accumulated during the Revolutionary War. If you're interested, look up the whiskey rebellions. The second point is safety. Because when you're using a chemical process or distillation to produce something that is ultimately going to be consumed by people, and because it does involve some potential toxicity, you can consider those regulations as a way of protecting you from yourself. Incredible device. It was a present for my children. It knows where I am on the planet, and then it can get me to my house. All I have to do is as I'm told. So if what we were going to be doing today is actually distilling ethanol as opposed to the isopropyl, this would be regulated, just so you know. Finally, I want to talk about the methanol controversy. Whenever you get into distillation, very early on in the process, you'll hear about all of the issues regarding toxic methanol. Understand that when you ferment a pure sugar, like sucrose table sugar or glucose or fructose, these will produce little or no methanol. But when you expose the yeast to polysaccharides like pectin in fruit or cellulose in grains, you'll produce a small amount, yet no longer trivial, methanol. Now, what that means is that the process of producing the methanol occurs in the fermentation not in the distillation. So if you make your own beer or you make your own wine, you're making methanol and you're drinking it. The reason it isn't dangerous is because it's so dilute. And as an interesting sort of aside is that one of the major treatments for acute methanol poisoning is to actually give the patient an overwhelming amount of ethanol. The reason for that is that methanol itself is not very toxic but in the liver is converted into formic acid and formaldehyde, and they are very toxic. By providing a large amount of ethanol into the system, you compete with the methanol for the alcohol dehydrogenase, the enzyme in the liver that converts the methanol into the poisons and reduces the amount of those poisons that are made or spreads it out over time. So you can think about when you're making your own wine and you're drinking it, the ethanol to some extent is protecting you from the methanol in that wine. The reason they don't talk so much about the methanol in a simple fermentation is because it is so dilute. 
you simply can't drink enough of it to get yourself into trouble. If you drank enough of the, the fermented beverage, you would get sick or get into trouble long before from the toxicity due to the ethanol rather than the methanol. The reason it's an issue with distillation is because we're going to be both concentrating and separating out the different fractions. And because the methanol has a very high vapor pressure, very low boiling point, it's concentrated near the front of the distillation. So you could potentially drink most of the methanol that you made in the fermentation, and that's why it's dangerous. Now, a lot of people think that when you're doing a distillation, it's a discrete process. In other words, you bring the still up to a certain temperature, all of the methanol will be removed, the temperature jumps up, all of the ethanol is removed, the temperature jumps up and all the water is removed. It doesn't work that way. These are overlapping curves that are representing the concentration of these different components. So in a typical fermentation, you can expect to produce about two to 3% of the ethanol in methanol. And so by removing most of the methanol in the first part, the foreshot of any kind of a distillation, you're removing most of the methanol from the system, but not all of it. Every chemical compound that's present in the pre-distillate will be present in the distillate. Every single drop, if there's methanol in there, will, be, will contain methanol from the very first to the very last, but the vast majority of it will be in the beginning. So if you remove 2% of that early distillate, you're gonna remove most of the methanol. When we do this, we are even more conservative and we remove 5% of the final distillate volume. So we're moving even more of the methanol, but there's still going to be some methanol left behind, much less, and it's going to be diluted in the final blending. So again, it becomes safe. Now the question is, what happened from last week? Okay, so this has been fermenting for about a week. I unplugged the heating pad that we have below the insulation last night, just to let this cool down a little bit. And I'm gonna take the little thermal sensor out of here. It's been regulating the temperature. And then we're gonna pull the lid off like this. Oh, that's fabulous. It's a lot less oppressively sweet, uh, like the molasses when we first mixed this up. That was like getting a spice cookie kind of jammed into your face. Now there's a slight aroma of the molasses, but there's also a, a smell of coffee, dried fruit, kind of like raisins, and a very faint aroma. I'd call it maybe like a high quality pipe tobacco, kind of earthy. I'm gonna to have to taste this. Now, if you come around over here, I'm gonna show you something. You'll see this from the other side. But the inside of this container has these little marks that have been placed on the inside to measure volume. And you can see over here that we're at about 12 gallons, which represents about 45 liters. You can't see the 45 below there, but we've made about 45 liters of this liquid. Now, you can see a little bit of scum around the side. The molasses produces very little foaming. It's not like bananas, which create this enormous mushroom of, of glop coming up the top. So you can afford to do a rum or a molasses very full in the container, just in terms of utilization of your volume. Now, when we mixed this stuff up, we added the molasses and we measured the specific gravity before it began to ferment. And the reason for doing that is in order to get an estimate for what kind of alcohol production we're gonna get, as well as an end point when we stop producing more alcohol and stop using up sugar, the specific gravity stops dropping. The way we measure the specific gravity is by using a device called a hydrometer. This is a calibrated float that is designed to sit inside of a column of liquid like this. And depending on the density of the liquid, you'll get this to float at different depths. So with the high concentration of sugar and water, this was a very dense liquid, and this tended to float at a point, if you look at this little table that they've got marked here, all the way down here at 1.080, specific gravity. On a scale where pure water is 1.000. If you look over here a little bit 
to the left, you will see that that corresponds to a generation of alcohol. If all that alcohol were converted into, all of that sugar were converted into alcohol, you would produce about 10.5% alcohol. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna measure the specific gravity and see how much lower this has dropped as we've converted the sugar water into alcohol water. So I'm gonna take this over here and we're gonna take some of this liquid, get a good quantity of it, and we're gonna fill up our cylinder. Now at this point, you don't have to have any concern about contamination because this is gonna be distilled, boiled in just a couple of uh, minutes. So let's see what we got. But before we do that, Mm. It's got alcohol in it. It's good. It's really good. Now, bring this over here, and we're going to spin this float in here like this. Now, sometimes if this sticks to the side, you can spin it around a little bit, but it isn't spinning. It isn't sticking. So I'll try to get this around so that you can see what kind of number we have here. It might be difficult to see the actual numbers on the camera, but I'm reading on this about 1.010. That's the first line before the 1.000. And if you look at this, you can see that the 1.001 which is, let's see if I can see this from here. I'm having to read this backwards. 1.010 corresponds to a production of about 1.2%. So if you take the 10.5%, subtract from that the unfermentable sugars, or maybe some of the sugar that we simply haven't fermented, we have a net of about conservatively 9% alcohol in this container. Now what that means is if we drain off about 40 liters of this, leaving behind about four or five liters in here to produce the dunder, I'll talk about that later, we'll get 40 liters at approximately 9% alcohol. If you do the math, that generates about 3.6 liters of pure 200 proof alcohol. Now, you won't get all of that out in the still. Some of the stillage, the material that's left behind, will contain a little bit of residual alcohol. So conservatively, I think we could generate about three liters of pure alcohol out of this. Now with a dilution to about 40% or 80 proof in a finished rum, that means we're going to generate about seven and a half liters of finished rum out of this container. Also, remember when I talked about the methanol in the four shots, if we're going to put, get about 3.6 liters of alcohol out of this or ethanol, that's 3,600 milliliters. 1% 1 of that is 36 milliliters. 5% of that is five times that, 180 milliliters. So that's the quantity of methanol that we're going to throw out in the four shot from this container here. Now what I'm gonna do is show you what happens to get the alcohol out or to get the, the wash out into the bottles using this very convenient valve that they put on the side of this. So I've got these empty containers down here. And what I'm gonna do is drop this in here, and then I'm going to turn on the valve and allow it to flow. A little safety stop here. And you can see the liquid is beginning to pour in. Now, one of the things about this is that in the recipe last time, I showed that I only used molasses. Now a lot of recipes will actually incorporate sugar, either raw sugar, brown sugar, table sugar, in order to stretch out the molasses. I don't like that uh, because all the sugar is going to be doing is adding flavorless alcohol to the final product. And you can't imagine, say, a Scotch whiskey maker in the Highlands of Scotland taking their malted barley and throwing in bags of table sugar. I mean, yuck. So if you want to add additional alcohol to this, or you want to add additional flavor to this, 
add more molasses. I would generally stay away from sugar. Now I'm going to finish, uh, finish filling all these up and we'll transfer this. All right, so the last step is we're going to remove the dunder, the material that's left at the bottom. And if you're wondering about what that means, take a look at the first video where I go into the details about what dunder is and why we're saving this material. All right, that's about it. So now what we're gonna do, let me just see if I can get this closed without making a huge mess here. Then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a little cheesecloth on the top of this, and we're going to store this for a very long time at least several months. Put it in an out of the way place. And then what I'm gonna show you now is how we put the still together. So I've decided to pause in the construction here because today we're not gonna just show you how you would produce rum but we're going to produce a flavored or an infused rum. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a device like this. This is a stainless steel cylinder that contains a small grid on the bottom. And by placing this in the hot alcohol vapors as they're rising through, any botanicals that we place inside of here will infuse their flavors into the hot alcohol as it's then condensed to the, the final spirit. This is called a gin basket because typically what happens is this is used to create gin. When you take a still and you fill it with a neutral alcohol, in other words, just water and pure flavorless alcohol, you'll then put coriander and juniper berries in here. And as that alcohol vapor passes through here, you will create gin. You can do the same thing by producing a flavored vodka. You can put uh, oranges or lemon or cherries in here. You can produce a variety of different flavors. Today, what we're gonna be doing is infusing additional flavor to an already flavored spirit, which is rum. Now, at the end of the last video, we linked a poll to allow our viewers to vote on what kind of flavor they wanted in here. And so we gave them the choice of coffee, chocolate, cinnamon, or vanilla. And the winner was vanilla. So I'm going to take these Madagascar vanilla beans and I'm going to place them into the gin basket. These are very, very pungent. And I'm gonna use a scissors here to kind of break them up a little bit just to give the vapor a little bit more chance to get inside of them. So we're gonna cut this up to maybe in thirds. And I'm guessing on the quantity here, it's somewhat of a guide, the amount of uh, cardamom and juniper berries that they use in making gin that gives me an idea of about how much to use. The vanilla is extremely potent though, so I probably want to err on the side of using a little bit less rather than a little bit more. And now what I'm going to do is take this vanilla and I'm going to place the gin basket up here like this. And then we're going to finish the assembly process with a little help. All right, I've just plugged this in. We're running about 3000 watts through here and it's going to take about 40 to 45 minutes for this to get up to temperature. I'll turn on the reflux condenser and allow this to operate. So we're gonna put this into full reflux. And then eventually when these levels begin to fill up with liquid, we'll begin the process of doing the separation. Okay, so it's been about actually closer to an hour and you can see all of the plates have equalized and they're all creating the reflux uh, gradient that's gonna produce the high concentration of ethanol vapor up here. And if you focus in on the temperature way up here, 
This is in Fahrenheit. That's just the nature of the gauge that we got. And you can see it's running at about 95 degrees. So it's still quite cool. Because of that, we're not getting really any kind of vapors through here to condense. But eventually, once I begin to turn down the cooling power of the reflux condenser and begin to allow some of the vapor through here, we'll begin to accumulate the four shot, which is the methanol. And one of the things to notice is I'm not going to be using the parrot function here. The parrot is a useful tool uh, for distillations that are called stripping runs, basically a fast distillation that separates most of what you want to eventually work with from the um, solids and the other heavy oils that you don't want to end up in the final solution. And when you do that, using the parrot allows you to place a hydrometer in here and do an active measurement of the specific gravity, how much alcohol you're producing. But because it has a fairly large contained volume in here, when you're flowing the liquid out of here, it tends to smear the distinctions that you're trying to make between each one of the different cuts. So because we're only going to be doing one distillation here, I don't want that smearing. And so I'm dumping the liquid directly out of the bottom here. And what we're going to do is we're going to accumulate about 180 milliliters of the four shot, which is the methanol, and we're going to dispose of that. Now that's a high quality alcohol. It's got methanol and ethanol in it, and you could burn it or you could use it as a cleaning agent. But because of safety reasons, I think probably the best thing to do is simply dispose of it. Or if you're really careful, put it in a different room in a different colored vessel because this will be a toxic liquid. You don't want to mix this in with anything else that we're doing. Now I'm going to turn down the, the capacity of this reflux by simply turning the valve that sends some of the cooling water to it down. I'm going to begin to inhibit the flow through here to the point where, again, the temperature will begin to rise relatively quickly and we'll start to get some of the vapors coming through here. So let's start like this and see if we're right. We'll kind of keep an eye on that. This will take a couple of minutes of adjustment. Okay, you can see that we're at about 175 milliliters here. And in just a couple more milliliters, what I'm gonna do is transfer this out, the four shot, and we're gonna dispose of this. But you wanna be very careful. You don't wanna mix this in with anything else that you could possibly consume because this is toxic methanol. Now, one of the interesting things with this, as we transfer this out, is a lot of people ask me about the bubble plates here. What happens when they get loaded up with the hydrogen sulfide that they are re removing from the mixture? They will get sort of a gray, black, greenish patina to them. After a couple of runs and an accumulation of some of that material, you can easily clean these off and make them look almost brand new by simply taking a small quantity, a few grams of citric acid in some warm water and soaking them overnight. And the next day they will look almost like they did when you first got them. So it's an easy way to remove all of the, uh, the sulfur that we're trying to remove from this mixture. Now this is jar number one and it's considered one of the heads. There is a division that's used in the sort of hobby industry of heads, parts, and tails. And basically what that means is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the process. During this process, I don't really do a lot of analysis of what we're doing because we've started. All we have to know is when to stop. And so when we get farther along, I'm going to do some specific gravity measurements. And when we get this material down to about 20% or 40 proof, you're pretty much at the end. Most of the stuff that you're gonna get beyond there is gonna be pretty funky and probably something you're not gonna to wanna to save. But during the process of collecting all these little individual samples, I don't do a lot of intermediate analysis because afterward, what I'm gonna be doing is the blending and the selection in order to produce the flavors that we're looking for. And there's really no value other than to separate them at this point to doing an analysis at, at this early stage. One thing I would though tell you to shy away from is tasting. You wanna keep your head straight and you don't wanna get half inebriated when you're doing this, when you're working with a lot of power and hot liquids, you wanna stay sharp. So what I usually do is after I build up a fair quantity of this and I'm done with this, I'll put caps on each one of these jars. I will put them aside and wait till the next day in order to be able to do the analysis. So we'll let this go for a while and we'll just start accumulating some jars.
Okay, I have a high suspicion that this is probably going to be about the last beaker or last jar. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pull this out, put this in here like this, number 22. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to measure the temperature. Because when you do specific gravity measurements, you need to do them at 20 degrees centigrade, which is what the hydrometer is calibrated for. So if we take a look at the temperature of a couple of these vessels, they've been sitting around for a while, they're pretty darn close. The later ones are a little bit cooler because of the ice water that we're using in the calibration. So what's important is when you do the final estimates of the calibration, what you want to do is you want to use a correction table, and they are easily available online. Brewhouse that makes this uh, still publishes them, and they give you a table to make a correction for the increased density of the alcohol at lower temperatures so that you'll get an accurate reading of the, of the specific gravity. Now, what I'll do is I'll show you what kind of output we got from this. We'll start out with the very first vessel that we got out of here, which was number one. And I'm going to fill up the column with some of this, and we're going to measure what the specific gravity is of the liquid that came out of here. So I'll pour this in here. I'm just transferring between jar and beaker because it pours with a little bit less spilling. And then we'll put the float in here. And I'll try to spin it around and you get an idea of what kind of concentration we got out of here originally. And it's pretty high. You can see that this is around 190 proof, 191 proof. So that's pretty concentrated. It's about 95%. Now, what we'll do is we'll allow a little bit of spillage between or mixing between the two of them. It's not that critical. So nothing left in here. We'll go ahead and put this back. And we'll measure something a little bit later, like let's say 11. Where do we got 11 in here? This is a good one, like this. Again, I'll do the transfer to the other beaker just so I don't spill this or as much of this. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and measure what the specific gravity is a little bit later. Remember that correction tables mean that as it gets cooler, the number is going to be artificially low in terms of proof because it makes it denser. But that's easy to calculate if you use the table. Now I'll put this in here. And again, we have an idea of what the concentration is. It should be dropping, which it is. And you'll see that right now we're running it around 185 proof. Now we'll go ahead and take a later number. Let's say 15, 16, something like that. Let's pick 15 here. Okay, getting substantially less dense. If we look at this, we're down around 100 proof. So we're dropping. And it's going to be slightly more because this, as we measured, was about 17, 18 degrees centigrade. And then finally what I'm going to do is measure the last one that I think is probably close to about 40 proof or 20 percent. That's the last one I took out of here. This one here. Now this should float substantially higher. And as you can see, it does. If you look at this, this is around 40 proof, maybe 42, something like that. Close enough. So I think we're pretty much good, and I'm going to stop the distillation at this point. What we're going to do is we're going to put caps on all of these things, and we're going to let this last or wait until tomorrow. It's quite late. This has taken a little bit of time. and. We're going to taste these and decide which of these we're going to keep and which of these we're going to dispose of and then blend them to what we think is the best flavor. And sometimes it's good to have a couple people around to sort of 
bounce ideas off of. But ultimately, what we cover in this channel tends to be more of the science and the technology behind the distillation. And the blending and exclusion of different cuts is more of the art of distillation. And rather than cover that with you, what I would do is recommend you take a look at a channel uh, by Jesse, who runs a YouTube channel called Still It. He's a New Zealander. And he does a very good channel and really goes into the art of blending and he blends rums and tells you a little bit about how and what the philosophy is behind it. So I think it'd be a good idea to take a look at his channel and we'll put a link below in the description. Now, if you like kind of what we're doing here, this sort of subject matter is just part of the kind of science that we do. But nevertheless, if you do like what we're doing here, give us a thumbs up and give us a comment because I read all of the comments and I try to answer any questions that you bring up. And it also is an opportunity for you to suggest other topics that we might cover. Furthermore, that kind of involvement with the videos is what drives the YouTube algorithms to spread these videos around a larger audience. The bigger the channel gets, the larger the audience, the more we can afford to purchase the kind of equipment that we're using for our videos. It helps you and it helps us. In any case, remember, science is fun. And as long as you stay safe, you can really enjoy practical science. So stay safe, have fun, and we'll see you soon.